Father Thomas Hurst. I'm the President Rector of St. Mary's Seminary and University. In name of, of St. Mary's and in particular in the name of the Ecumenical Institute of Theology, I'd like to welcome all of you to our Dunning Memorial Lecture. This lectureship was established with the gift of J. Fitzgerald Dunning at the beginning of the foundation of the Ecumenical Institute over 40 years ago. J. Fitzgerald Dunning was a graduate and a longtime trustee of Johns Hopkins University. His family's pharmaceutical company was famous for the invention of mercurochrome in 1919. So if you're, if you're in my generation or, or older, you remember kind of painting this on yourself. They, uh, and we're, we're very grateful for the Dunning family for establishing the lectureship, which has brought scholars such as Jeffrey Wainwright, Walter Brueggemann, Yaroslav Pelikan, Monica Helwig, N.T. Wright, and in the past also, Dr. James Dunn to, uh, to St. Mary's. And tonight, uh, we're welcoming back Dr. Dr. James Dunn to be with us, to, to speak to us on, on a topic that is, I found, engaging and encouraging to all of us. The, uh, I'd now like to invite Dr. Michael Gorman, who is the Raymond E. Brown Professor at St. Mary's, to express a special word of welcome to those who are attending a conference on John, Jesus, and history. So, Dr. Gorman. Thank you, Father Hurst, and again, welcome. Now I have my non-logistical hat on, at least for the moment. Good evening. This is an unusual event for us to combine the annual Dunning Lecture with the beginning of a scholarly conference, an international scholarly conference on the Gospel of John. John, Jesus, and History, Engaging the Legacies of C.H. Dodd and Raymond E. Brown. So we want to extend a special welcome to all of you who are here for that event, which kicks off tonight and continues tomorrow until noon on Friday, and a special welcome to our presenters and our organizers of that conference. I'd like to mention the names of the organizers and ask them to stand up here just for a moment before we introduce uh, Dr. Latham and Dr. Dunn. Uh, Dr. Paul Anderson could not be here yet. He's been delayed. Uh, Dr. Craig Kester from Luther Seminary is here. Craig. Um, Dr. Tom Thatcher. T Tom, there you are. Uh, of Cincinnati Christian University. And Dr. Katrin Williams from uh, University of Wales, Trinity St. David in Wales. Welcome to all of you who are here. We will try to make sure that all logistical arrangements are, are met. Um, to your satisfaction. Bear with us. We've had some difficulties, but now we go on to the good part. So thank you for being here. Good evening. My name is Brent Latham. I'm the Dean of the Ecumenical Institute of Theology. We're the younger division of St. Mary's Seminary, the oldest Catholic seminary in the United States. And for 45 years, the Ecumenical Institute has been offering master's level education in theology to men and women of all uh, denominations and of various faith traditions. We are pleased to have you here tonight and we always like to begin the Dunning Lecture by asking how many of you are in the building for the first time? Welcome. Welcome. Uh, we think once you're inside and see what we've got you may want to come back. And we especially thank those who came a great distance. Our format tonight is simple. We begin with a scintillating lecture, followed by brief but exhilarating time for questions, not diatribes, but questions. And then after the lecture, Dr. Dunn will uh, grace uh, those of you who still have books that you want signed by again returning and doing some of that. And I do want to express thanks to our friends at Hearts and Minds Bookstore for making that possible. They'll be here again tomorrow. And for those of you who are conferees, uh, they do have a number of the, the books by, by conference presenters and uh, that are related to the topic, so that's there. Dr. James D.G. Dunn is the Emeritus Lightfoot Professor of Divinity at Durham University, where he taught for more than 20 years. We learned today that his first degree was in economics and statistics, which undoubtedly prepared him to become one of the premier Paul scholars and indeed New Testament scholars in the world. He's the author of over 20 monographs, as well as several significant commentaries. He's been a groundbreaker for more than 30 years. Probably every scholar in this room uh, who's actually heard of the New Testament 
can remember their first encounter with something that uh, Jimmy Dunn has written and, and the way that it was uh, both uh, uh, changing in perspective and uh, the, the way in which you realize that this was a mind and a scholarship that you'll be reckoning with for decades to come. Rather than list his text, I want to let us get down to business rather soon. And so I want to point out that, uh, like me, he has also uh, spent time as a local Methodist pastor. I, I managed to be a local Methodist pastor for one year, and Dr. Dunn for 40 years. In 2004, he was our Dunning lecturer, and at that time, he delivered a lecture titled, Remembering Jesus, What the Quest of the Historical Jesus Forgot. I wonder if you forgot to mention something that night, because tonight you've come back to give us the lecture, Jesus as Remembered by John. So we are eagerly anticipating what you have to say to us, and I invite all of you to join me in wel welcoming Dr. James Dunn. indeed for that uh, welcome. It's a, a great honor to be back here again where we have several good memories of past visits and to be uh, done as the diminutive of Dunning seems particularly <laughs> appropriate for this evening. Uh, I hope you have a handout which I shall be referring to at various points. The lecture I have to apologize concerning because it is abstracted from uh, the chapter, the draft chapter of uh, one of the chapters of volume three of my uh, Christianity in the Making, um, in which I spend quite a lot of time with John's Gospel, of course. So the abstraction is from about chapter 24 or whatever it's called. And uh, um, I'm having to uh, assume, uh, as it were, that you have read chapters 22 and 23 and so on where I have looked at the formation of the Gospel and uh, the first three Gospels, Synoptic Gospels. In that chapter, the chapter in, in the book, I'm looking particularly to compare the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Thomas, which is very interesting because Thomas is in many ways much closer to the Synoptic tradition of Jesus than is John's Gospel. But John made it into the canon, and Thomas didn't. Hmm. So, that's the question I'm dealing with in the chapter. The paper I'm going to give tonight is about one quarter of the chapter, and doesn't deal with Thomas, I'm sorry, deals only with John, but I hope uh, it will be uh, sufficiently relevant for you. So, to begin, Jesus as remembered by John. Introduction. When those who are unfamiliar with the New Testament Gospels turn from the Synoptic Gospels to John's Gospel, they might well experience something of a shock. The Synoptic Gospels, despite their distinctive features, are largely of a piece, cut from the same cloth. When the three Gospels are set out synoptically, the degree of sameness and overlap is very striking. John's Gospel, on the other hand, seems to be so different. There is a similar Gospel structure, a passion narrative with an extended introduction, and still a fair degree of overlap, but as we shall see in a moment, the character and content are so very different. The difference is such that it poses a major question for any exploration of the way the Jesus tradition was remembered and used in the last decades of the first century and into the second. For with the synoptics, there is a remarkable similarity in the way they show the Jesus tradition to have been used and developed. But with John's Gospel, a major question arises. What has happened to the Jesus tradition? Has John departed from the Jesus tradition, familiar to us from the Synoptic Gospels? Has John so developed the Jesus tradition that its beginnings in Jesus' own mission have become obscure? The Synoptic Gospels made it clear that the Jesus tradition was flexible in the use made of it, in the way it was retold, and in the interpretation given to it. 
but always they retain the same basic character and structure of the Jesus tradition. The same, yet different. So that it was quite feasible to discern the impression of the one who had made the impact, which resulted in and was expressed by that tradition. With John, however, the same, yet different, is hardly applicable. And the question arises whether the controlling influences which maintained the basic sameness of the Jesus tradition in the synoptics ceased to be effective in the case of John's Gospel. Alternatively, were there other influences shaping the earlier Jesus tradition into very different forms, transforming its character changing the impression it gave into something very different from the impact first made by Jesus himself? Or again, was the stream of synoptic tradition only one stream of tradition emerging from Jesus' mission? In other words, did Jesus make very different impacts on different individuals and groups so that no single gospel or group of gospels can claim to have retained and to represent the full measure of Jesus' mission? These are, the que- these are questions, and it will be appreciated, uh, which run on into the non-canonical Gospels, but it cannot but be significant that they are first raised by John's Gospel. So, too, the puzzle of John's Gospel. With the first three New Testament Gospels, a natural first step was to explore the interrelationships, some literally, some probably oral, between them. With John's Gospel, however, the difference with the Synoptic Gospels are so great that it is difficult to compare John so directly with the Synoptics. Since familiarity with the New Testament Gospels can make readers and Christian congregations somewhat blind to the differences between the Synoptics and John, it will be well first to indicate just how extensive and how deeply rooted are these differences. On the other hand, there are good, uh, there are a good many indications that the tradition behind John's Gospel is also deeply rooted, that John has been able to draw on good historical tradition in his composition. Most fascinating will be the indications that the Johannine discourses, so very different from the synoptic memory of Jesus' teaching, are also rooted in synoptic and synoptic-like tradition. So I begin by looking at the differences between the synoptic Gospels and John's Gospel. And these can be summed up and typified in the following terms. And I refer you now to the handout, to the first page there, uh, where in a table there is the differences listed between the synoptics and John's Gospel. And I'll let you read these for yourselves. Older harmonizing explanations, keen to affirm that John's Gospel is as historical in its presentation as the synoptics, try to explain such differences in terms of the different audiences to whom Jesus spoke. For example, the synoptics recalling Jesus' teaching to the crowds, John recalling Jesus' teaching to his disciples. But as David Friedrich Strauss pointed out long ago, the style of Jesus' speech in John's Gospel is consistent. Whether Jesus is depicted as speaking to Nicodemus, or to the woman at the well, or to the Jews, or to his disciples. And the style is very similar to that of the Baptist, as indeed to that of 1 John, the first epistle. The inference is inescapable that the style is that of the evangelist or of the evangelist's tradition rather than that of Jesus. And it can hardly be judged other than scarcely credible that Jesus was remembered as having uttered the I am assertions, so vividly descriptive and self-assertive, and yet not one of the synoptic evangelists bothered to recall or use them. How could such 
self-identifying assertions made by Jesus during his mission have been so ignored or blanked out by the earlier gospel writers. The only obvious conclusion is that the I am sayings, so characteristic of John's gospel and so distinctive of John's gospel, cannot be traced back to Jesus himself. This is Jesus' tradition developed well beyond its roots in Jesus' own mission. B, the historical value of John's gospel. Despite these differences, there are many indications that John's gospel is well-rooted in the historical events of Jesus' mission. One often cited instance is the various geographical details which are scattered throughout John's account. Since they serve no discernible literary or theological purpose, they probably belong to the historical reminiscences from which the passages containing the references are uh, have originated. For example, and I refer you to the second half of page one of the handout, these examples of uh, the allusions only in John. All these are unique to John's Gospel and are best explained as historical details adhering to the earliest formulations of these traditions. Equally striking are the various overlaps between John's Gospel and the Synoptic tradition. A very good example are the traditions regarding John the Baptist. And I've noted the uh, agreements on page 2 of the handout. Uh, I should explain that this is... Uh, I've, I've left you to read these for yourselves since the lecture otherwise would be too long uh, since I've tried to put too much into it. There can be little doubt that all four evangelists were drawing on the same tradition. The memory of Jesus' first disciples, that his mission emerged out of the successful mission of the Baptist, and from what happened at the Jordan when Jesus was baptized by the Baptist. That is, with the descent of the Holy Spirit on him, confirming his status as God's Son. Almost the only part of the Baptist teaching recalled by all four evangelists is the Baptist's contrast between his own baptizing in water and the coming one's baptizing in the Spirit, which strongly suggests that their consciousness of having been given the Spirit was one of the self-defining characteristics of the early Christians across the range of churches represented by the four Gospels, a claim to being the beneficiaries of the promised baptism in the Spirit predicted by the Baptist. Both emphases that Jesus' mission began with the Spirit's descent on him after he had been baptized by the baptized, Baptist, and that the first Christians were those who were experiencing the Spirit directly for themselves, explain why the great body of earliest Christians had to begin their account of the gospel with the preaching and mission of John the Baptist. We can take it for granted that this memory and this basic story were integral to the oral tradition of the first disciples and churches from the first. And I've given you a list of further substantial overlaps on the second half of page two. These all share the synoptic-like character of the oral tradition, the same yet different, pointing to the same conclusion, that these are variations of the same core tradition which can be traced back to the beginnings of the Jesus tradition. Evidently, Different members of the initial disciple group drew somewhat varying emphasis from what was a shared stream of tradition, each with memories of the same period, events and teachings, but distinctively their own memories on individual details. Still more striking, however, are the further historical details which John gives not least in regard to the tradition which he shares with the Synoptic Gospels. 
Here again, the Baptist tradition is the most illuminating. For John seems to have been able to draw on tradition which the others had either set to one side or did not know about. John does not hesitate to include references to a period prior to the Baptist's imprisonment, 324, during which Jesus' mission overlapped with the Baptist's, 322 to 36, and during which Jesus' mission was apparently of the same character as the Baptist's, 322 to 26. Though John takes care to deny that Jesus himself practiced baptism for two. This tradition almost certainly goes back to the first disciples, since it includes the detail that some of Jesus' own key disciples had earlier been disciples of the Baptist. Chapter 1, verses 35 following. Neither detail nor emphasis was likely to have been invented, given the degree of embarrassment indicated elsewhere in the Jesus tradition over the extent to which Jesus could be counted as himself a disciple of the Baptist. Deserving of note is the clear evidence of how the oral Jesus and Baptist tradition could be and was handled. In the Synoptics, by omitting a not unimportant aspect of the tradition in order to prevent any confusion between the two missions and to highlight the distinctiveness of Jesus' mission, and in John, by focusing the retold tradition on the Baptist's witness-bearing to Jesus and on his inferior significance to that of Jesus. The fact that the synoptic tradition ignored or suppressed the overlap period, of course, makes it difficult for us to evaluate the Johannine tradition in the usual way, that is, by comparing John's version with the synoptics. But we can be sufficiently confident that the Johannine tradition too goes back to the first disciples and indeed in this case has retained a clearer memory of the overlap period than we could have deduced from the synoptic tradition. A simple uniform rule that the synoptic tradition is always more reliable than John's is immediately ruled out. John's version of the beginning of Jesus' mission is itself an example of how the memory of that overlap between John and the Baptist was handled in at least one strand of earliest Christianity or in some churches. I then go on to give other examples of the extra detail given by John, and that's from pages 2 and 3 of the handout. I'll read a little of the first one. The, in the cleansing of the temple episode, John has Jesus just saying, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again, John 2.19. The very words which Mark and Matthew attribute to false testimony at Jesus' trial. It's hard to avoid the conclusion that Jesus was remembered as having said something like this and that while the way it was turned against Jesus at his trial amounted to false witness, Jesus did in fact predict the destruction of the temple and possibly or probably also spoke about its rebuilding, whatever he meant by that, in which case John is a better witness to Jesus than the synoptics and shows how the oral memory of what Jesus had said was retained in the Jesus tradition despite the way it had been used against Jesus. I won't read the other two points that I've made there. One of the striking differences between the synoptics and John is that whereas the synoptics focus on Jesus' mission in Galilee, the bulk of John's narrative focuses on Judea and Jerusalem, chapter 2 to 3, chapter 5, and from 7, 10 onwards. 
it is not unlikely that Jesus did pay more visits to Jerusalem or did spend longer in, Ju- in Judea and Jerusalem than the synoptic tradition allows. First, the early period of overlap between the missions of the Baptist and Jesus suggests early mission in Judea. Second, Luke records the close discipleship of Mary and Martha, Luke 10. And though he locates them in a village passed through on the journey to Jerusalem, John is clear that the village of Bethany was close to Jerusalem itself. Thirdly, the how often of Jesus' lament over Jerusalem in Matthew 23, how often he would have done this, suggests much more frequent trips to Jerusalem. Four, the fact that the synoptics omitted such an important element of Jesus' mission as its beginning within the Baptist movement heightens the likelihood that they have done something the same with regard to a mission of Jesus in Jerusalem and Judea. That is to say, it is quite possible that John's focus on such mission of Jesus is more firmly rooted than the synoptics allow. And fifthly, that Jesus had close disciples in Jerusalem or in the near environs is suggested by the secret disciples who provided the donkey for his entry into Jerusalem in Mark 11 and so on, and the room for the Last Supper in Mark 14, etc. In that case, why did the synoptic tradition ignore or set to one side Jesus' earlier Jerusalem visits. The fact that they deliberately excluded the overlap period with the Baptist is evidence that they felt free to do so. And perhaps Mark, or the tradition on which he drew, wanted to make the final visit to Jerusalem the climax of the Jesus story. And Matthew and Luke simply followed him, or their main stream of tradition, in doing so. Since the leadership of the earliest Jerusalem community of believers in Messiah Jesus were all Galileans, according to Acts, one could understand why the tradition which they began and taught focused on the Galilean mission. John, of course, does not ignore the Galilean mission, even though Jesus coming and going to Galilee in the early chapters of his gospel does read rather awkwardly. The miracles included in that material at the end of chapter 4 and chapter 6, the feeding miracle, are the closest to the synoptic miracle tradition. But the likelihood grows throughout John's Gospel that John had a source for the mission of Jesus which was different from, or rather in addition, to the remembrances of Peter. The figure indicated and obscured by the reference to him as the one whom Jesus loved several times in John's Gospel. If that disciple is also referred to in chapter 1, 35 to 39, then he would have been a good source for the overlap period between the Baptist disciples and Jesus' missions, including the recruitment of the Baptist disciples to become followers of Jesus. Similarly, if that disciple is also referred to in chapter 18... Then he had good contacts in Jerusalem. He was known to the high priest. This suggests that this disciple could have known or cherished memories of Jesus' mission in Jerusalem on one or other of his brief visits to the capital, as also episodes and contacts like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, which other tradents largely ignored since the Galilean tradition was more familiar and so full of it in itself. With only John's attestation for the Judean mission, and given the freedom with which the tradition he uses or draws upon has represented the memories of Jesus' overall mission, it is difficult to draw firm conclusions. But the most likely explanation is that John has drawn on good memories of one or two or some visits to Jerusalem by Jesus, even if he has treated them in his own distinctive parabolic or symbolic terms. Then, see, thirdly, the teaching of Jesus. The contrast between, on the one hand, the synoptics' aphoristic sayings and parables, 
and on the other, the Johannine discourses can be overdrawn. For as you'll see, Jesus' teaching in John includes some parabolic material. And most intriguing, the Johannine discourses often seem to grow out of or to be based on more aphoristic teaching of Jesus as evidenced in the synoptic tradition. And I give you examples of this on uh, pages 3 and 4 of the handout. For example, the first one, chapter 3, verse 5, very truly I tell you, unless a person is born from water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Compare Matthew 18, 3, truly I tell you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the only passage in John in which he has retained a synoptic-like reference to the kingdom of God. So is John simply presenting it in a more radical way? Well, I haven't got time, unfortunately, to go through all these, but I ask you to glance down the handout to pages 3 and 4 uh, to see examples of where it's pretty clear, I think, that uh, John's uh, expositions, the sermons and discourses, are drawn on earlier material. It should also be noted that the discourses contain a number of parables not dissimilar to the more characteristic synoptic form, and three sequences of sayings again closer to the synoptic parallel. I'm referring to uh, John chapter 4, chapter 12, and chapter 13. Not least of significance is the fact that the overlap with the synoptic tradition at point after point indicates an independent awareness of the teaching which the early churches all remembered as Jesus' teaching. The relative lack of reworking by John at these points is both what allows us to recognize the parallel, the shared memory of the same teaching, and what enables us to say with confidence that John's discourses are rooted in the memories of what Jesus taught during his mission in Galilee or in Judea. In short, for all their difference in style and the elaboration and enrichment of individual sayings and motifs, it would appear that several of the discourses of John's Gospel, at least, are deeply rooted in synoptic-like tradition. In addition, the possibility should not be excluded that John knew other synoptic-like tradition, not picked up in the synoptic tradition itself, and treated it in similar manner, as a theme to be developed and elaborated in similar discourse style. Are the Johannine discourses, then, simply an example of how radically and extensively the Jesus tradition could be elaborated within the churches of the emerging Christianity of late 1st century AD. Thirdly, point three, how did John go about composing his gospel? It can be assumed that the production of John's gospel in its final form was the end result of a lengthy process. The beginning and ending of the process are fairly clear. We have seen enough evidence that a fair amount of the content of John's Gospel can be traced back to first-generation believers, to eye and ear witnesses who belonged to Jesus' own first close disciples. The Baptist tradition in John's Gospel alone is sufficient indication and illustration of that conclusion. It is equally evident that a final redaction added both chapter 21 and the final third-party attestation of chapter 21, verse 24. Between that beginning and ending, however, the character of the process is obscure and op open to many varied speculations. Has the final version undergone very substantial editing, as Rudolf Bultmann uh, famously argued? Was the author able to draw on different sources, 
the most plausible suggestion being that he was able to draw on a signs source. Can the stages of development or composition be disentangled from the finished product, even different editions be envisaged? I'm referring here particularly to Raymond Brown's work on this. For example, was there a Samaritan phase of development? where it was the prologue of John's Gospel, John 1, 1 to 18, a relatively late edition. Might it be the case that the final form of John's Gospel was not actually intended to be the final form in which some of the anomalies and disjunctions would have been ironed out? Or indeed, is it possible that the Gospel was never intended to be finished? but consists actually of a number of moving parts within the gospel structure, allowing a flexibility and variation in use of the gospel in worship and meditation. Perhaps the longest-running debate has been whether John knew one or more of the synoptic gospels, perhaps reckoning on their inadequacies and attempting to make good the defects, the argument that John did know and owed a debt to one or more of the synoptics has some substance. The parallels noted above certainly give grist to the mill and continues to be maintained with some force. Unfortunately, the argument is in part at least a product of the same literary mindset which has skewed so much of the discussion of the Gospels over the last century and a half. For most of this period, the dominant working hypothesis has been that any similarity between the Gospels indicates a literary influence of one on the other or a literary influence from a common written source. My own working hypothesis is different, that there was a lengthy period, 20 to 30 years, during which the Jesus tradition was known and used almost entirely in oral form and that during that period, the Jesus tradition was celebrated, taught, transmitted in various forms, the variety much as we still find it in the synoptic tradition. Here we need simply add that the synoptic tradition, while typical of the way the Jesus tradition was known and used, should not be regarded as the sum total of the Jesus tradition. The corollary of that hypothesis, in the case of John, is then clear that John knew much synoptic-like tradition, or the Johannine tradition began from synoptic-like material. Since there is no clear case of literary copying of, by John of synoptic tradition, it makes better sense of John in this context, in the context of a predominantly oral society and predominantly oral Christian community, to conclude that synoptic-like tradition was part of the bedrock material on which the Johannine presentation of Jesus was founded. And here I <coughs> refer particularly to C.H. Dodd's famous work on the historical tradition. So far as the final form of the Gospel is concerned, it would appear that John felt free to mold the tradition available to him in his own distinctive way. i give you three Examples. First of all, the frame of Jesus' mission. So far as the frame of Jesus' mission is concerned, John differs quite markedly from the synoptics. Luke, for example, used J Jesus' sermon in the synagogue of Nazareth to provide a window into the contrast of Jesus' mission which Luke wanted to highlight, Luke 4, 16 following. In contrast, John provides uh, a double opening bracket. First of all, the marriage of uh, Cana in John chapter 2, 1 to 11. A tradition totally unknown to the synoptic Gospels, though possibly illustrating the point made in the earlier tradition about the wedding-like character of Jesus' mission in Mark two eighteen following, by telling it as a story rather than as formal teaching. The symbolism is obvious. The water, intended for Jewish rites of purification, transformed into high-quality wine, illustrating the transformation brought by Jesus' mission 
quite probably once again as a way of making the same point that Mark makes in chapter 2 of Mark 21 and 22. Second, the cleansing of the temple, John 2, 14 to 22. Most probably, this is John's version of the tradition shared by the synoptics, but placed by them at the end of Jesus' mission. It is highly unlikely that there were two such episodes in Jesus' mission, one at the beginning and the other at the end. Apart from anything else, the two accounts have precisely the same character. The sellers of animals and doves are expelled from the temple precincts and the tables of the money changers are overturned, with some variation in detail, as one would expect in oral tradition. The conclusion which follows most naturally is that John has elected to begin his account of Jesus' mission with the cleansing of the temple episode because, together with the wedding at Cana, it foreshadowed and epitomized the effect of Jesus' mission in relation to his native Judaism. He would transform the Jewish purity ritual into new wine. He would replace the temple with his own body. Just as subsequently, the water he gave is far superior to the water of Jacob's well in chapter 4. And as the bread of life from heaven, he far transcends the bread which Moses gave in chapter 6. Somewhat as Luke removed uh, Jesus preaching in the synagogue at Nazareth to the forefront of his account to indicate the character of what was to follow, so John felt free, evidently, to move the climactic cleansing of the temple, likewise to set the scene and epitomize what was to follow. This may seem an overbold move, but only if we assume that the evangelists were bound to order their material in strict chronological order, an assumption which we have no reason to make and which runs counter to too much evidence to be followed without question. If John felt free to shape the beginning of his account of Jesus' mission, he felt equally or more free to construct the closing bracket, the event which sparked off the decision to do away with Jesus. In the synoptics, it was the symbolical cleansing of the temple which set off the final spiral of opposition to Jesus and led directly to the arrest of Jesus made possible by Judas's betrayal, Mark 14, 10, 11, and parallels. John, however, provides a quite different trigger. In John's Gospel, it is the recalling of Lazarus from the dead, which is the immediate trigger to the final moves against Jesus. The signs which Jesus had performed, climaxing in the recall of Lazarus to life, led the high priest himself to the conclusion that it was better for one man to die than for the whole nation to be destroyed. John 11. John reinforces the point by narrating how famous the raising of Lazarus became and how threatening to the status quo the, supporting, the resulting support for Jesus and his message quickly became in John chapter 12. Of this raising of Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11, none of the other evangelists show any awareness. One could conceive that the earlier tradition set that episode on one side for fear that the authorities might act against Lazarus. But the synoptics were most probably written about 40 or more years after the event. Would that still be a factor then, when the vicinity of Jerusalem had been devastated during the siege and conquest of Jerusalem and its residents widely scattered? Moreover, the Johannine presentation seems to reflect the beliefs and concerns of the later Johannine churches. The, the sign of Lazarus recall to life, prefiguring Jesus' own resurrection, chapter 11. The high priest unwittingly confessing that Jesus died for the nation and to gather into one the dispersed children of God, 
chapter 11, 51, 52. Many of the Jews believing in Jesus, chapter 12, verse 11. The expanding influence of Jesus being counteracted by expulsion from the synagogue of those who believed in Jesus, chapter 12, 42. All this to reflect the high and distinctive Johannine Christology. It is hard to avoid the conclusion that John moved the account of the cleansing of the temple to the beginning of his gospel to provide a window through which the unfolding of Jesus' mission and revelation should be seen, and that he did so also to make room for his own version of the climax to Jesus' mission, the climax which triggered the decisive action against Jesus. More has to be said about the raising of Lazarus, but it is best said in the context of John's account of Jesus' signs. So secondly, uh, this is 3b, Jesus' healing, uh, mission of healing. <coughs> oh, may I? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Very kind. I was about to gasp. Water! Equally striking is the way that uh, John has structured Jesus' mission of healing, John chapter 3 to 12, in which C.H. Dodd, uh, which C.H. Dodd designated as the book of signs. John seems to, be, uh, seems to work to a pattern of a characteristic miracle which highlights an aspect of Jesus' mission and its significance. No type of miracle is repeated in John's gospel. It appears to be the case that John has taken six characteristic miracles, perhaps even miracle types, in order to draw out the significance of each. That, that significance is typically brought out by the often lengthy discourse or dialogue which is attached to the miracle before or after. The point is underlined by the term which John uses consistently for the miracles, sign a significant or significant event which conveys a meaning far larger than the event itself. The most persistent themes are new life and light from the darkness, as already signaled in the prologue. And I've, in the handout, you'll see on page uh, four of the handout, uh, the uh, various signs, the six of them I've listed, 2, 1 to 11, 4, 46 to 54, 5, 1 to 9, 6, 1 to 14, 9, 1 to 7, and 11, 1 to 44. One of the questions which this raises is whether John draws the actual miracles which he relates from his tradition, or does he provide a sequence of miracle types? One, partly drawn from specific tradition, feeding of the 5,000, healing of a child at a distance. Two, partly illustrating types of healing for which Jesus was famous, healing of paralysis and blindness. And three, partly stories which express the richest significance of Jesus, even if not actually rooted in specific events. The water of Jewish purification turned into abundant and high-quality wine, recalling Lazarus to life. Let me look at these three possibilities a little more. The first of these possibilities is already intriguing, since John's account of the healing of the royal official's son is so different from the parallel in Matthew and Luke. And since virtually the only significant points of agreement between John and the synoptics on what is obviously the same tradition of the feeding of the 5,000 are the actual numbers, 5,000, 200 denarii, five loaves, two fishes, 12 baskets of fragments. These are the only points of agreement in this, the different gospel accounts of the 5,000 feeding. Here is important evidence of the degree to which the same memory and tradition could be diversely retold. The second of the possibilities suggests that John or his tradition had no qualms in telling the story of Jesus using types of his healing ministry 
rather than any particular instances. C.H. Dodd makes this point well. And thirdly, the third possibility cannot be excluded, since it is so hard to locate both the water into wine miracle and the recalling of Lazarus to life within Jesus' mission, and since they so powerfully illustrate the effect of Jesus' mission. This could suggest that John or his tradition felt free to document Jesus' mission with parabolic stories and not only actually remembered events. If this is the case, it would be quite wrong and a serious misunderstanding of John and his purpose to accuse him of deception. That is to say, the evidence of John's gospel itself suggests that we should not assume that he saw his role as simply recalling memories of actual events of Jesus' mission or simply reciting the earlier tradition in the fashion of the synoptics. John may have concluded that to bring out the full significance of Jesus' mission, he had to retell the tradition in bolder ways, which brought out that significance more clearly. And thirdly, the Johannine Discourses. As to the Johannine Discourses, it is the rootage of the Johannine Discourses in tradition which echoes and parallels synoptic tradition, which suggests the most plausible way to understand these discourses, namely that they are discourses and themes which, are, which express reflection over some time on things Jesus said and taught and acted. Reflection in the light of the richer Christology which Jesus' resurrection and exaltation had opened up to them. In other words, they exemplify not simply the passing on of Jesus' tradition, but the way that tradition stimulated their understanding of Jesus in the light of what had happened subsequently. John himself attests and justifies this very process. Two points. Twice he explicitly notes that Jesus' disciples did not understand what Jesus was saying or doing, but that they remembered them and later understood them in the light of Jesus' resurrection and glorification. That's John 2.22 and 12.16. This makes precisely the point that the claims regarding Jesus were rooted in Jesus' own mission as illuminated by Easter. His immediate disciples already had a true knowledge of Jesus during his mission, but they did not fully understand their knowledge was still imperfect. To the same effect is the role ascribed to the Spirit, the paraclete. During Jesus' mission, the Spirit was not yet, that is presumably not yet given, John 7.39. But when the Spirit came, he would teach Jesus' disciples everything and remind them of all that Jesus had said to them, 1426. He would guide them into all truth and declare more of Jesus' truth that they were as yet unable to bear, is John 16, 12 to 13. This is the same balance between revelation already given and received, and fuller revelation still to come, a fuller revelation which makes the revelation already given clearer and which enables it to be more fully grasped. In short, it is hard to doubt that John's version of Jesus' teaching is an elaboration of aphorisms, parables, motifs, and themes remembered as characteristic of Jesus' teaching as attested in the synoptic tradition. At the same time, John's version was not pure invention, nor did it arise solely out of Easter faith. Rather, it was elaboration of typical things that Jesus was remembered as saying. Unlike the late, later Gospels, John does not attribute the fuller insight into who Jesus was to secret 
teaching given to a few following Jesus' resurrection. Rather, John roots it in the Jesus tradition which he shared with other churches who presumably knew many, mainly the synoptic tradition and which was itself rooted in the memory of Jesus' mission. This was the truth of Jesus for John, not a pedantic repetition of synoptic-like tradition, but the significance of that tradition brought out by the extensive discourses which John or his tradition uh, drew out of particular features of Jesus' tradition as exemplified in the synoptic tradition. To criticize John's procedure as inadmissible is to limit the task of the evangelist to simply recording deeds and words of Jesus during his mission. But John evidently saw his task as something more, the task of drawing out the fuller meaning of what Jesus had said and done by presenting that fuller understanding as the Spirit both reminding Jesus' disciples of what Jesus had said and leading them into the fuller understanding of the truth made possible by Jesus' resurrection and ascension. So to conclude, point four. In short, John's Gospel cannot be and should not be simply paralleled to the other three Gospels. Although all four Gospels can be set in parallel, as in the Alland synopsis, the first three Gospels are clearly parallel in a way and to a degree that is not true of John's Gospel. That is why Matthew, Mark and Luke can be referred to collectively as the synoptic Gospels, the three that can be seen together. John's Gospel is not a synoptic Gospel. The distinctiveness of John's portrayal of Jesus should not be diminished or ignored. The older attempt to harmonize all four Gospels should be recognized as wrong-headed. John was evidently not attempting to do the same thing as the synoptic evangelists. And though we should recognize that all evangelists had theological axes to grind, the briefest comparison is sufficient to show that the synoptic evangelists were much more constrained by the forms of their tradition than ever John was. The closeness of the synoptic parallels cannot be explained otherwise. And contrariwise, it is equally impossible to make sense of John's gospel on the assumption that he was attempting to do the same as the synoptic evangelists. We should not hesitate to draw the unavoidable corollary that to read and interpret John's gospel as though John had been trying to do the same as the other gospels is to misread and misinterpret John's gospel. This remains a challenge for those who approach John's gospel from a conservative perspective. By so doing, they may be missing and distorting John's message. The truth of Jesus, the story of his mission and its significance, were not expressed in only one way, as though the gospel of Jesus Christ could be told only by strictly limiting the interpretation of the earliest Jesus tradition, the ways in which Jesus was remembered. It proved also acceptable that the character and themes of Jesus' mission provided the basis for fuller and deeper reflection on what Jesus stood for and achieved. Still, the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the same time, it is equally important to note that John clearly knew the same sort of tradition known to and used by the synoptic evangelists. <coughs> I give six points in summary. John follows the same gospel format in giving his account of Jesus' mission. Secondly, 
He had sources of or access to earliest memories of close disciples of Jesus, which filled out parts of Jesus' mission that the other evangelists passed over for understandable reasons. The overlap between the Baptist and Jesus' earlier trips into Judea and Jerusalem being probably the most obvious. Thirdly, the indications that John had good sources of tradition, Baptist tradition, attempt to make Jesus king in Galilee, contacts in Jerusalem, of which we would not have known had John not retold them, suggests that other parts of John's gospel are, prob are, are better rooted in historical tradition than we can now tell. The synoptists did not include all the traditional material available to them. John 21 25 speaks for all Gospels. Fourthly, John's use of the tradition of Jesus' miracles was selective. But the types of miracle he described and which he encompassed by profound discourse and teaching were mostly familiar as types of Jesus' healing ministry. Fifthly, Again and again, the elaborate discourses and teaching give evidence of being rooted in synoptic-like tradition or seem to be an elaboration of particular sayings and parables of Jesus known from the synoptic tradition. And six, John evidently knew the final passion of Jesus at first hand or from first hand sources, a claim which is emphasized at chapter 19, verse 35, in chapter 21, verse 24 in particular, the beloved disciple and Mary Magdalene may be identified as such sources. The most obvious way to explain and understand the distinctiveness of John's portrayal of Jesus is that John knew well the tradition which he shared with the synoptics and that he wove his much more refined fabric from the same stuff as the synoptics. The product and expression of many years of reflection on the significance of what Jesus had taught and done and on the significance of the revelation he had brought and constituted in his life and mission. While we should not understate the distinctiveness of John's gospel, given the many echoes and parallels in John, neither should we exaggerate the difference. John, in his own way, was telling the same story as the other evangelists. That he chose to do so by elaborating that story in his own way should be acknowledged and properly appreciated. John's gospel should be valued for what it is, not for what it is not. In terms of the oral Jesus tradition, John's gospel shows just how diverse and varied the Jesus tradition could become in its various retellings. The elaboration which John provided made his version of the Jesus tradition controversial. He sailed near the edge of what was acceptable. But the facts that John retained the gospel character and that its rootage in the earlier oral tradition was clear were presumably sufficient to ensure that John's gospel would be recognized as one of the four Gospels to be designated as canonical. Thank you. Thank you for a scintillating lecture and for a good beginning to the conference that's to follow. As I mentioned, this is the time when we uh, engage in uh, question and discussion, and uh, I'll ask you to stand and to speak your question loudly, and uh, Jimmy, if you're willing to briefly repeat the question so everybody knows what it is you're responding to, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, do, do you want to come up and field questions, or you want, I'll, I'll help with, with ordering, I've seen yeah. two hands so you, far. You, you do the ordering. I'll do the ordering, and yep. you do the answering. <sighs> try, try to. Yes. Uh, can you elaborate as to what you consider to be the likely candidate for those signs? What is the sign source? Yes. 
What is the sign source behind John's Gospel is an interesting question of the various sources that have been suggested as sources for John's Gospel. The sign source, I think, is the most plausible uh, because of the numbering that John's Gospel gives to the uh, miracles that he, he records. Uh, the trouble is it, it's difficult to work them all the way through, and you can see, uh, I think, three are, are numbered, but there's six or seven in all, uh, and so it's not clear. Uh, I, I think it's possible, quite possible, that he's drawing on a collection of miracle stories. But remember, we're talking about uh, maybe oral tradition material. Maybe there were people who went around telling stories about Jesus' miracles. Uh, and so there's uh, oral sources of the oral way in which Jesus was presented, and John is drawing on that. Um, I don't think we should make much more of it than that. Uh, it would be difficult, I think, to argue, as some have, that this assigned source indicates a different way of looking at Jesus as a great miracle worker, full stop. Um, it may just have been a collection of material that preachers used. Hmm. You, the prologue of John's Gospel you're referring to particularly. Yes, yes I don't think we need to uh, hypothesize a source there. Uh, it's an interesting speculation because logos, word, is a very familiar uh, term uh, in wisdom tradition, in the Old Testament and so on. And uh, here is a way of explicating what becomes to clearer expression in Jesus, that Jesus it can actually be expressed, and it is. This is why, where John really breaks through previous tradition. The Word became flesh. This is a totally new concept and, and formulation, but it's drawn on that uh, tradition of the Word of God and also of the wisdom of God, which were ways, what we would say in Old Testament terms, of talking about the way God makes his uh, knowledge known and his will known to his people through his word and through his wisdom. Uh, and John takes the step of saying that word and that wisdom has become incarnate in Jesus. There's a woman here who's now got her head down, but did have her hand up. I guess she doesn't want to go anymore. Michael, did I see your hand? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so welcome back to Maryland. Uh, two names that are coming to my mind: uh, Clement of Alexandria, who spoke about the uh, uh, the John taking the physical facts of the gospel or the synoptics and giving them a spiritual spin. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I've tried to indicate in the paper that there's plenty of evidence that John is drawing on, uh, if you like, eyewitness traditional material. And no question about that. It's what he's done with that and the way he's presented it which begins to raise the problems. Uh, and uh, when you look at the, the par set John in parallel with the synoptic gospels, you might well conclude, as many have, that they're so different that uh, John cannot be rooted in any kind of history at all. My point is rather that there are sufficient indications that he is drawing on the same kind of material, uh, but that he's elaborated, he's reflecting on it, it's meditation. 
Um, so it's not a gospel in the same way that the others are gospels. It's not a, a historical gospel. Okay? Okay, we're going to go here, and then I've got two more in line. Yes, your question is, did John write at all for non-Jews? Is that your question? Yeah, right. Uh, well, mm, that's a, it is an interesting question when you compare John and the synoptics. Uh, the, but the point is, I think, when you look at the, the prologue in John's Gospel, the nearest parallel you're going to have is uh, in, say, Philo of Alexandria the Jewish scholar who is definitely interacting with uh, the uh, wider uh, philosophical thought world of his day. Um, so I think John is, is certainly engaging primarily with the Jews. And the Jews and John are either uh, the opponents of Jesus who have expelled him from the synagogue and so on, and those who believe in Jesus, uh, or the other Jews who have not yet quite made up their mind the Jews in John's Gospel, as you know, are uh, almost equally divided between the Jews who are anti-Jesus and the Jews who are saying, could this be the one we're looking for, and so on. So I think he's addressing that latter group of Jews and hoping to reach them. But the fact that he uses this wider philosophical way of presenting Jesus, that Logos is uh, um, much wider than anything uh, narrowly Jewish, Stoic philosophy and so on, Philo, etc., uh, that that he is he's trying to reach through to beyond uh, that the uh, local constituency Jewish audience to a wider constituency, um, and uh, it's a good question how well he succeeded. Now that I've got four questioners queued up, I'm going to ask you to please keep your questions succinct. Yes, you, please stand. Five minute answers. <laughs> one thing one should give to them. Maybe two. Maybe two. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the, the important thing about the New Testament is there is not one gospel, but four. Uh, you could cope with that quite easily, the first three. There, you get a very clear, similar picture uh, here and there, different. And so John's gospel, it's so different. Uh, so it's important to recognize that John was accepted in the canon uh, and was recognized as a legitimate Christian way of presenting Jesus. And one of the things I've been trying to do is explore the implications of that, all that, uh, the, the liberty which he felt 
to express Jesus in a way that would reach much further, way that would reach to people who are wondering about the logos, and the word, and so on, behind creation. So that's, that's uh, an interesting blossoming. And although it's quite true, he doesn't really deal with the Greeks. In fact, John's gospel is reaching to that wider philosophical reach. So a, it, it's a good way of, of saying that John did not see Christianity as simply Jewish, but as something reaching beyond. And it's John who is one of the major factors in a Christianity which grows beyond the Judaism of his time. I believe it was you. Yes. Because you had it up earlier. Uh, yeah, my question is if you could maybe elaborate on the uh, love disciple. I think the answer I usually get is, well, it's death to the apostles, John, and I'm going to argue. I don't think we know the apostles. So is there a way you could elaborate? Is, the, is it the apostle, or could it be the beloved disciple be somebody else, or you know, <laughs> <laughs> Who the heck was the beloved disciple? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> uh, and I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> that's why it's such a great question. Uh, I mean, John does refer to the beloved disciple a number of times, and there are indications that towards the end of the gospel that this beloved disciple was one of his main sources. But the, who the heck the beloved disciple was, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we want to think of him as one of the closest disciples, but was he one of the 12? Was he John? Uh, that would be great if we could really come to that conclusion. But we don't, don't really know. So uh, does that answer your question? Or <laughs> well, he doesn't, he doesn't get to come back to the well whether it does or not. Simp simply say that we don't know what the answer is. Hmm. Do you envision that in uh, in Mark's churches, Mark's churches, in Mark's churches, when they performed the Jesus material, did they ever produce something that would look like a Johannine discourse? <laughs> so, like in Mark's churches, do they always just say the ransom saying, and that's a one-off, and now we're done? Or are there occasions when they're going to tell there's the ransom saying, and then something that looks like an explication of it, like what we see? <laughs> What I'm asking is, is what John is doing unique to him? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, is, you know, yeah, yeah. He yeah. Does, or is that something that's going everywhere else? And we yes, see it and yes. Yeah, your question is really how exceptional yes. is John in the re-portrayal of Jesus' um, Jesus story? And the answer is we don't really know. Uh, but the great thing is that John was accepted uh, as part of the canon. I mean, uh, for me, I think that's an amazing thing, actually, because John sailed near the margin of acceptability. And we know from the other Gospels, uh, the second century Gospels and so on, how that extend, extended and how it proved to be unacceptable. But John stays in it. And so I, I find John tremendously important as telling us that the Gospel of Christ can be expressed, you, we can be f freer, in it. We're not bound by the synoptic tradition at, that we can only say that Jesus said this and, and not that. That kind of question John puts put to one side and says, to get hold of the significance of Jesus and importance, we've got to uh, think creatively. We've got to e express creatively how he came across. Uh, and the way he did it was with the discourses and so on. Um, and that, I think, gives gives us in our understanding the gospel and preaching of the gospel a tremendous uh, freedom that not not uh, the whole point I'm making in this paper is that that freedom is not constrained is not unconstrained it is constrained uh, by by the uh, its link with the synoptic tradition but beyond that it is unconstrained and that's that's very important uh, that uh, that we should recognize that already in the first century the, the significance of Jesus was being expressed in richer, uh, more creative ways than simply in the Synoptic Gospels. Okay, there was, right. Yes. Yeah. 
in John's Gospel, yes? Yes, you could put it that way if you like, yes. 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 Right. Right. Uh, well, the remember what you've heard from the beginning. Uh, is not presumably simple statements of what actually happened, historical events. Okay? It is the significance of Jesus which is being uh, expressed and so on. Um, that's, that's why I, I hasten to emphasize that if we insist on reading John's Gospel in the same way that we read the Synoptic Gospels, we almost certainly are misunderstanding it. A, that the, the, the scene at the foot of the cross is interesting because it is uh, b specifically, there are only a few occasions in John's Gospel where specifically they said, someone was there and I saw it, it actually happened. A, and that is a point that's being made. A, I mean, it's being made to make the significant point about the blood and water. Um, uh, and, and there's a theological point being drawn out from it, but the insistence is made that this, is, this was eyewitness testimony. Now, that doesn't happen a lot in John's Gospel. It does happen once or twice. And I'm very happy to accept that as something which is traced back to eyewitness testimony. But I, I think John's Gospel as a whole is trying to explore the richer, deeper, fuller significance of Jesus, including the Jesus material uh, tradition and so on, and, and uh, miracles, etc., and to draw them out in a much richer way, fuller way, than a simple retelling of the story of miracle and of what Jesus actually said in the Sermon on the Mount would do. That's why it's, it's important to see, to get this balance in John's Gospel between the historical foundations and the rich exposition out from these historical foundations. I just wonder if there was some story. No, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we do have other folks and so we don't allow second <laughs> questions. But come back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're allowed to decline. <laughs> <laughs> and you're always allowed to decline. No, no, I, no, it's fair enough. No, it's an interesting question because my first, uh, my thesis in Cambridge and my first book was Baptism in the Holy Spirit. And in those days, I was moving around very much with the, the what was then the Neo Pentecostal movement and so on. And several times, a, people would ask me, had I been baptized in the Spirit? Uh, and my answer would be, in my understanding of the baptism of the Spirit, yes. In, <laughs> in your understanding, no. <laughs> uh, and so I was always open to richer experiences of the Spirit. I've never spoken in tongues. I haven't got a particular interest or desire to do so. But if that was given to me, then fine, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> But uh, is that enough of an answer? <laughs> my, my children will say that I have this reputation. So uh, there will be time. <coughs> well, <coughs> if you to narrow me down to, I'd have to say John the Apostle, I think. Yeah. Uh, sorry, John the Apostle. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm not sure. And the fact that he doesn't make a point of it himself means that he didn't think it important uh, for his gospel readers to know that he was the authority. 
So, so I'm, I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> John. Hi. Uh, thank you, Dr. John. Uh, it, uh, the range of Katrina is perhaps a parabolic area that really represents uh, reduced impact and increased measures of reporting impact. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, yeah, interesting question, uh, because in that episode, Jesus is quite terse with the Mary, and he kind of tells her off, uh, although he does, then does, he says, he says, that's right, that's true, that's true. Um, I, I think it, it just shows that uh, the memory of Mary was quite diverse uh, in the early gospel material. And it's interesting that, uh, that it, it, it contains that episode where Jesus uh, responds rather negatively, uh, might they say harshly, to his, to his mother. Um, uh, but the significance of that, I'm not sure how, how to draw that. Hmm. Versus the literary weight of the tradition. Uh huh. I just right. have a question regarding that. Um, lots of people speculate on parallelism, chiasm, structural elements. Hmm. Hmm. Would that be also part of the oral tradition? And do you understand that? Or is that strictly a literary element? Uh -huh. Yes, the difference between a written and oral. I, well. As is probably clear from what I said, I think it's really important that we appreciate that these early decades, 20, 30, uh, perhaps more, uh, of the uh, early decades were oral, where the tradition was oral. We're told by those who've studied it that um, uh, writing possibility was only 10% or less of the population. Uh, now, w we live in a post... Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the guy who taught us to print. Um, uh, print. Good, that's the guy. Give, give us it again. Gutenberg. Gutenberg, yes. We live in a post Gutenberg. Thank you for that. My memories get shot through with these kind of details. Uh, and, and so we take it for granted uh, that we're looking at literary things. And one of, the, one of the things that has quite surprised me in responses to what I've written in. in uh, uh, the first volume of Jesus Remembered, is a, how many have uh, really assumed that uh, you, you do it all in terms of, of written, uh, of people knowing the written material and so on. So I, I suspect that we've got 30 years in which the tradition is being formed and reformed, grouped and regrouped, elaborated and cut back and so on, uh, and what we have in the Synoptic Gospels shows us uh, in, in that material the kind of thing that was happening in the past 30 years, say. Uh, how the Jesus tradition was told and retold and used and reused and so on. And, and it's at that point that I think you can, you can talk about the sort of thing you're talking about, the, the literary uh, style features that come through there, which... We could argue that some of them go back. You know, there was a collection of parables or a collection of medical stories and so on. And, uh, but that's all speculation. What we have in the Synoptic Gospel is wonderful because it shows us, I think, gives us a, an insight into how the story of Jesus was being told and retold and retold and retold in those uh, years between 30 and, and 60 or 70. Uh, and, and to try and read it in literary terms, I think it's to misread it. Friends, oh. in Chichester, England, it's three in the morning. <laughs> Two in the morning. Two in the morning. Oh, I've got it wrong. I've, I've been trying, which, which is, I didn't major in statistics in, in college, so, nor math. Um, Jimmy's wife, Mita, has traveled along with him, and we want to thank them both for coming uh, such a great distance. And we want to thank Jimmy for a stunning lecture and Q&A. Thank you so much.
This is the point where I don't want you all to treat me like I'm Jesus writing in the sand, and by the time I look up, uh, you'll all be gone. I have one announcement to make, and then uh, Dr. Gorman has uh, several more. Will the Brocks wave their hands wildly, please? They're at a hotel downtown. Leave them up. If there are other folks that are at downtown hotels that need to come back tomorrow, and if you all want to coordinate transportation to avoid expensive cab rides, or if you have a car and are coming and want to offer cab rides, please come up to these wildly waving hands as soon as we're done and do that coordination. Thank you.